hours for what? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to do some work for them. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Between the Rolls. This is over here on Murder Hobo Inc. Uh, I've already lost how handsome I am on the camera. That's fine. It's a hot mess tonight because we are doing Iron DM. It's always a hot mess when we do that. <laughs> yeah, that is that is absolutely true. Oh my goodness, where are we at today? I feel like I should say something about we'll sell you the whole seat, but you'll only need the edge. Uh, but I, I can't remember how that goes anymore. Something about I know the dirty it's... version of that, but that's all right. <laughs> My kids Never mind. are still awake right now, so yeah, I'm going to avoid that for right now. <laughs> Guys, uh, if you have not seen the show, uh, you, well, no, sorry, no. I already went through that. What am I doing? I'm supposed to give you the spiel. Follow us on Twitch, <laughs> follow us on Twitter, take a look at our YouTube archives. Uh, you can also join in on our Discord discussion. I'm going to have these two create something amazing, something wonderful, something that they didn't realize they were going to make until one minute ago. It is dementia. I do need those little fish pills with the omega acids. I'm deteriorating at 30 years old. It's not good. I just found out I have a bum knee now, and it's going to stay there forever. It sucks, uh, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. Wait, wait. Do so you have a hobo knee? He has a hobo knee now. It only acts up when I'm not doing murder hobo things. So it's uh, funny how that works. <laughs> anyway, if you want to join in on discussions, you can hit us over on Discord. If you want to join in live, then what you need to go is to go to mhoboinc at gmail.com. Ask for a seat on the wonderful, awesome Between the Roll Show or one of our many, many, many one shots that we have. You can't join the campaign, which is what's happening this week, uh, because we're too good for you. So, yeah, I got distracted and I stopped following my list of spiel things because the next thing I'm supposed to say is uh, about one of two things. Folks, we promise we're professionals here. At Motor yeah, we are professionals. We know exactly what we're doing at all times. This is part of the script. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's just part of the show, guys. Bye. That's it. Uh, 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 uh. All right. Uh, guys, no. If you don't want to look at our uh, uh, video format and look at our wonderful jokes that we do online, like I was just pretending to have a stroke just there, uh, and you just want to listen to me blabber on like an idiot, then I suggest clicking on one of the links below and going to our audio-only podcast. They're a delight to listen to, uh, unless you're the person who's talking, in which case I spend most of the time screaming, like, no, Kyle, shut up, shut up. You're not supposed to sound like that. Ah, see, you would miss that amazing, wonderful video gag and now i'm gonna <laughs> this now you messed it up <laughs> uh you know what let's just let's just go for broke guys let's go for broke all right oh, anyway <laughs> finally uh we also have a shop where we sell some really awesome stuff uh you might know it as calamity uh or just regular murder hobo merchandise there's a link down below it takes you over to threadless uh amazing wonderful shirts and uh i've bought 17 sweaters of my own personal show cred so i can wear them every single day this winter as soon as it hits about 10 degrees maybe five degrees i'll start wearing those every single second i can did you Guys, get every available color i did not damn it <laughs> i just got the same one over and over again that way i can either wear a different one every day and feel clean or wear the same one every day and let other people think, oh, he's clean. He's, he's <laughs> just got multiple versions of that shirt. Yeah. Guys, <laughs> we are professionals here. And how do I know that? We have sponsors. And so I'd like to thank our sponsors, Pirate Dog Dice, uh, proof that you can indeed make a turd into a D20 and make it roll natural 20s. Uh, when it rolls natural ones, though, it does release the bomb inside and it just right on top of your desk uh so not only will you feel like shit for not saving your party member's life but it will then smell like shit as well but you'll mm -hmm. need something to cover that smell up and so may i suggest adventure sense adventure sense get the putrid sewers it works wonders for covering up the poopy smell uh if not though i suppose there's ancient 
library, there's Rubble Road, there's Tavern, there's all these wonderful sorts of things. Thank you very much, Frank, who is typing secret messages. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, finally, that's not all they do. That's one of the many wonderful things we like to talk about here, uh, just so that we can force them to create wonderful new smells. Uh, but they also have the Shine Project for those who are trying to write stories uh, and are having a little bit of difficulty. The Shine Project is a book that's kind of a step-by-step. -step. How do you get from here to there and back again and ask all the important questions you didn't think to ask yourself? And uh, as a, a DM, I do recommend it. And when they finally make the DM version of that book, I'll certainly buy that or I'll make Frank give it to me because he's my sugar daddy. Uh, finally, there is 48 hours on going on Kickstarter right now for their one-of-a-kind project, How to RPG with Your Cat. Uh, most of the goals have been reached, uh, including the main goal, which means, yes, this product is going to be made, uh, but we need donors like you to donate more money because... We're still missing a few stretch goals, like the cat scratching post tower, dice tower, uh, for both your cats to play in and for you to roll your D20s in. And, of course, they are going to come out with a new adventure scent if they reach their goal, which is uh, Carol's box. choleric Carol's fence box. post. <laughs> uh, which does have a hint of fish smell to it. Uh, your cats will love it. But that's all the spiel I have to you guys. Let's go ahead and round and introduce everybody at the table. I am, of course, Kyle, the wonderful host of this evening's Between the Rolls and the host of the Iron DM going on tonight, as well as the GM for this Thursday's uh, uh, show, Cred Campaign, Cthulhu Rises, Everybody Dies, to my left, to my right, or possibly to my middle, to my right, or to my middle, to my left, because I deleted the camera and then turned it back on. So who knows where I'm actually am, considering the position of everything. Uh, let's introduce David. David, tell us a little bit about yourself and where we can find you. Hi, I'm David. You can usually, most of the time, find me here on VTR on Tuesdays. Uh, I'm also on the campaign shows. Uh, to Calamity A and <laughs> Calamity B, and also Cacophony. Uh, I play Zadar and Cacophony, Ingve in Campaign A with Calamity, and Crow in Campaign B for Calamity. Uh, every now and then, I'll do a one-shot, uh, but otherwise, that's it, folks. I have no life. It's just Murder Hobo 24-7 with the thing, so... You're muted. <laughs> what, me? No, Kyle. <laughs> ah, I was waiting for my, my segue. Your awesome, amazing segue. The segue to end all segues. I can't think of you. I can't think Ian, of it. Go ahead. <laughs> all right. With that non sequitur, uh, I am Ian, and I don't have as much as uh, cred as David, but uh, more behind the scenes element. Uh, so uh, we are furiously planning Motor Hobo Con 2. That we will give more details on in the future, which is going to be super fantastic. So uh, wait for our press release on that. We will uh, have some really cool things in plan, and it'll be twice as big and large at minimum uh, as the last con. Uh, also, this is Snacks. Uh, he was a willing participant in our How to RPG with Your Cat. A uh, very rough cut video, but um, really cool Kickstarter if you want to be involved with, uh, have your free companion be part of your game. So uh with that i'll toss it back to you kyle <laughs> that's right 48 hours on that kickstarter get on there for carol's choleric litter box that's the new adventure that's the new out. adventure oh man okay <laughs> it is going to be a great one well yeah we talked a little bit this is campaign week going on we will have on thursday the cred campaign cthulhu rises everyone dies on saturday we are going to have calamity campaign who's showing up side a side b i don't know and then, of course, we have Margu, I'm assuming, happening on Sunday, side A. Yes, Margu. Hold on. I'm reading the directions from Frank right now. Coming in live. <laughs> For the people the who aren't able to see it at home, we have a series of gnomes that hold up cards. Sometimes they're really short, and the camera doesn't get them all, so we just kind of have to improv it. 
you can't give them socks. No, you cannot no, do give, not them, give socks. them socks. No, it gets rowdy after that. Um, the stocks get really sticky and crusty and gross, and just don't give it to them. What? That's awkward. Anyway, that's that week. But <laughs> let's talk about last week. Last week, last Thursday, we had cacophony, 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 cacophony. And David, why don't you tell us what happened on cacophony? All right, cacophony. Cacophony was a great episode last week. Uh, yes, it uh, appears that uh, Camille and Sadar were hired by Mortimer J. Sneed to find out what happened to his amulet of tra- time travel. So we've taken the case. In case if you missed the other episodes, Camille and Sadar actually have the amulet. They were given it it was given to them by Zephyr who uh, is trying to get it away from Mortimer because he's time traveled too much. He has officially been diagnosed with time dementia. So uh, Camille and Zadar kind of debated about whether or not to take uh, Mortimer to go and find uh, a possible cure for, for his dementia or to, um, Leave them there at the Grand Academy. Well, apparently the Academy made our decision for us because they had Mortimer shackled to his hospital bed. So, so we then uh, leave the Grand Academy. We go back to the island where we were supposed to destroy the box and we set up our friend Maurice, who is now the guardian of the nuclear football <laughs> from, you know, the the temple and then also the mystery box so uh we've tried to destroy it in a volcano because they are always seals each time that we try to destroy it so anyway so we leave him with that and then we venture off we cross the high seas it's smooth sailing for a while and then we end up with some encounters, some bad weather. We get shifted a little bit. Next thing you know, we're off the coast of Sedalus, where we've run into uh, Lord Torgal, his wife, and uh, yeah, the manor being built. So yeah, the ships uh, sustain heavy damage. The, the mast actually snapped. So we took a, a launch to go... Uh, find provisions, supplies, or whatever to make repairs. We run into Lord Torgal. We get some of the things. He reluctantly gives us some of the things that we need. Then we get on our way, and then we pass the city of Sedalus under construction with a wall going up around it and all that huge, sprawling city. So, and that's where we left off, folks. So <laughs> we're making our way for that. We did have one encounter uh, with the sea monster. I think it, it, I think we ended the episode uh, shortly after that. But uh, anyway, you have to real tune question. In to, the yes. real question is Lord Torgal. How is he compared to Dewey Dacamel? Lord Torgal Torgal is a freaking racist. <laughs> is what he turns so out Dewey, to be. Is <laughs> Dewey is better. Right. Dewey is better. I like it. Yeah. We have a minute. In case you don't know, we have a Minotaur crew. Uh, and our captain is a minotaur, they're privateers, and uh, yeah, so Lord Torgal was not happy when two minotaurs showed up with uh, Zadar and Camille trying to procure timber for the, <laughs> for the repairs on the show. So, so anyway, that's how that episode ends, folks. So, when we pick it up again, we'll be taking off uh, again on our voyage. Uh, we we ended up in the city. We ended the episode of the Land of the Gnomes, uh, where this great library is. We just landed in the city. Uh, we tried to dock in the city, so we, other ships were coming in with us. So it was a race to see who could get that port slot. <laughs> so, and some elves cut us off. <laughs> so. The Minotaur captain is going to go have a word with the elf captain. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> fine. Totally right. fine. There you go. And I'm not muted. And I said that. So that's why. Yeah. Nice All progress. right. That was last Thursday on Cacophony. Last Saturday, we had our one shot. We had something quite a bit of a rarity going on where we actually had a repeating one shot. 
A repeating shot? I don't know. I'm trying to be clever with it, but it's not working. Where we had a set of entirely new players. Maybe a barrage. There we go. Barrage shot? Multiple one-shots that are in the same volley. It'd be a barrage. Barrage shot. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, barrage. Or, no, okay. We're done with that thought. We have the uh, the crying jester where the players go through an inherited inn uh, uh, and had some uh, interesting adventures. Uh, obviously, they actually went through the one shot because the last time this was played was uh, Blake and I playing through I it. So say. obviously, <laughs> we didn't actually have anything to do with the one shot. So it was an entirely new episode for anyone else who played or watched it. Uh, and that's really, you're just going to have to watch it yourself. Maybe compare it to that first time where Blake and I played through it and then just realize why why I don't play one shots anymore. <laughs> I'm too oh, disruptive. You... That's, that's really the yeah. question of it. Uh, some odd reason they think I'm a better host. And that's also just not true. Yeah. All right. But that has been last week. Let's get on with tonight. I don't know if that was loud enough. Iron DM! Yeah. Allie's GM. There we go. <laughs> oh, hi. Ooh, fancy. I apparently was so loud with my drumming that my computer wants to turn on the band uh, mm. app so it can record all the beautiful music I'm making. There we go. Rock band started. <laughs> yeah, all right. Uh, Tonight we're talking about some spooky, wonderful things. We're going to make uh, villains tonight. Uh, And uh, whenever we talk about villains uh, and Frank is on the show or beside the show or within 7,000 feet of where the show is being recorded, he always says, hey, guys, you should check out the 2E Blue Book on villains. (laughs) It's the best. And I was like, well... Okay, fine. I'm about to be visited by three little children. Except there's not the three of them. The worst villains of all. The worst, the worst villains. They're, like, they're like Uh-oh. drunk, drunk little villains. Uh, they ruin your life. No, I'm kidding. Uh, actually, no, this is going to be recorded. Let's tell you the truth. Uh, you Small ruined my life. Way. I don't get enough alone time with my wife because of you. Um... You're a monster. All right, uh, folks, we're seeing what therapy is going to look like. Uh, therapy needs many years. So, <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, the secret to children take this to your mother. That's a secret to every good relationship. Who doesn't it have really a is. To the snacks for their significant other? Absolutely. Oh, that was a crash. Okay. Anyway, tonight, uh, we are going to go and create two villains on the spot. Neither of these folks own the blue book of villains. I do because uh, once I looked up to Frank as a wonderful role model and I realized how foolish I was then, but I still went and bought the book anyway. And so tonight we are going to create two wonderful villains, I should hope, but we'll see like that. And we decided to break it down into piecemeal. So these players, instead of having any sort of heads up on this whatsoever, have absolutely no idea. So when we're creating villains, uh, you want to come up with names out now, or do you want to wave it till the end? No, names at the end. No, names at the end. All right, fine. Here we go. Let's start at the beginning. We are going through the blue book style here. What is the occupation of your villain? Occupations usually make a an outstanding villain, for example, Sweeney Todd is the mm-hmm. demon barber of Fleet Street, well, or you have Cruella DeVille, who is so a furrier. As an mm-hmm. aside, though, that would as assume someone that belongs in society. Are we making a humanoid or something that participates in a societal or clanical group? Because that would rule out uh, aberrations, monsters, and, and I know I was thinking that and my idea was more of an aberration, but I'm gonna have to make this practical. You know what? Let's make this Don't a little humane. What? <laughs> what? I will destroy you, child. Uh, 
we're going to make this a societal villain, someone who's within uh, reach, I think. So, once again, what is your villain's occupation? I think we have delayed this long enough. I will destroy you, child! <laughs> Please call DCS on me so they can take this child away from me. No, I'm kidding. Uh, let's... Oh, no! <laughs> David, I'm going to start with you when you are finished talking about your application. Please take care of Arlo. Okay, I've got I've got one ready. If you need a second, uh, I've had one in mind, but actually, thief is the occupation that I have for mine. Uh, uh, leader of a thieves guild. So that's that's where I'm going. So I was going to say child, but Kyle already took my idea. So. Hmm. Okay. Child. I was kidding. <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> um, no, seriously, what do you have in mind? All right. Well, uh, not waiting <clears throat> for our glorious uh, Lord and benefactor, Kyle. Uh, mm-hmm. I was going to select Sin Eater. Uh, for people who may be familiar, it was actually a role hired out by communities. Uh, in various Eurocentric uh, communities, to be an individual who would hear your uh, your sins against the community or other people, kind of like a, a pre-confessional type of function. Mm. Uh, sometimes people would even whisper uh, their sins into a cake or a bread that the sin eater would consume and then would absorb uh, the sins. So Nice. Uh, Still going the aberration route if Kyle doesn't pull a wild card. So okay, I was about to say that could be an aberration. Ah. So, ah. but but actually, yeah, I mean, uh, I I've had heard of mention of that 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 was an actual thing that there was something called the Sin Eater. So uh, it, it, it you made just, that up, didn't you? <laughs> no, but the Sin Eater, no, like legitimate. <laughs> it was the person would be shunned in the community. It was kind of like how. Mm-hmm grave diggers were shunned and so were other people that dealt with the dead the, the sin eater was mm-hmm. an outcast of society and that was the, either they became an outcast because they were sin eater or because they were an outcast they became the sin eater but because they knew everyone's secrets and um ate everyone's sins they were shunned like as if like they had uh, they were unclean so mm. okay okay i think i learned that from like atlas obscura which is a fantastic uh, non-sponsor of ours, but if you ever want an interesting newsletter to be subscribed to, Atlas Obs- Obscura, you'll learn some random things. You do. <laughs> All right, real quick for me again, just uh, real quick. David, what was your occupation? Uh, thief. Thief. Mm-hmm. All right. And Ian, what was yours? Sin eater. A sin eater. What? I assume you already explained what a sin eater is, yes? Yes, he did. <laughs> uh, no, this the best part. This if you is... click like and subscribe, and you could listen to our old recordings. Uh, That's true. You are asking everything of the world of me. How dare you? How <laughs> dare as you? A, as, as a I... teal deer, they're individuals who worked in a confessional capacity to uh, either literally eat or figure, you know, metaphorically speak, eat the confessions and sins of a community. Okay. A uh, real quick question. Uh, we'll start with Ian, then I'll move over to David. Fire away. Why did your uh, villain choose the career path of Sin Eater? Not chosen. It was something that had to be Not chosen? Oh, actually. <laughs> uh, so it was thrust upon a member of this community as it was a necessary function for the community to survive. Um, I, I don't know if we're at, at racial or organizational components yet, but I can yeah. uh-uh. I'll hold on that. Okay. All right. And uh, David, why did your uh, villain choose to be a thief? Uh, poverty. <laughs> poverty. All mm-hmm. right. Sounds yeah. good. Uh, All failed, right. failed farm would be it. So. <laughs> okay. What is your villain's objective whenever you know what? Let's roll on this one here. Mm-hmm. If you got a D4 handy, roll a D4. Something that you can at least split into quadrants of four. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. That would be a two. A two. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, your villain is going to be your... Okay. The s- child, I will destroy you. Between 5th <laughs> level and 10th level, Ian, from 10th level to 15th level, just to kind of give you an idea of where your villain is at as far as their objectives go. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, what is the objective of your thief? What is, what's their goals in life? Uh, their goal uh, is to basically form a syndicate of uh, thieves made from outcasts uh, who um, have had failed farms and things like that. Uh, okay. They were basically they were taxed to to death for their um you know by the lords and nobles Mm -hmm. and uh you know for crops not being as productive and it wasn't their fault there was you know some kind of plagues or affliction with the with the crop or something like that so so it was all circumstantial under which that that their crops and all that have failed so Mm -hmm. A couple of the the farm owners or whatever who supposedly just have fled and just moved on or you know just perished or anything like that within their poverty and they were left with nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, they formed a sort of thieves guild to kind of sure. kind of graze off the local lords and stuff like that. So okay, so their objective, uh, as I'm getting it, is they're just trying to. A gather Survive. wealth, gather power, essentially. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, Ian, what is the objective of your villain uh, uh, when your party encounters them between 11 and 15th level? Um, so by by describing it, it, it will force the question of what the racial background is. is okay, that go for it. Yeah, that's acceptable. Uh, so I'm envisioning an, a, an odd villain that is inherently by the book awful good i'm thinking a flump so uh, since flumps are dedicated creatures to eliminating evil they detect it psionically they have an organization um if they're con- in in so much communing with evil and scouting it all the time they have to shunt it to something thus the necessity of having a sin eater um so some of the organization of flump there's like a hive mind leader in as much as uh mind players as that's say. all one distant cluster of creatures, um, the Githyanki, the Githrai, the uh, Flumps, the Mind Flayers are all in a kind of psionic family. Um, so there would need to be a sense of an evil sink to help keep that race pure. So why not have a lawful good evil creature in a capacity where uh, this creature being encountered at you know 10th to 15th level has become a, a massive sink for all the psionic evil that the race itself has accumulated. So ultimately, this flump sin eater's objective is to purge sin or evil from all races that it in the hive mind uh, encounters. So that would be forced purging of races of their uh, desires, impulses, and other things. So like forced mind wiping, psionic control of these races. So the players would perhaps encounter um, this flump either in a planar capacity or even a dungeon capacity um, and then learn of the intentions to whatever race they're from or country civilization, this massive, powerful flump would be coming into basically this mind blank to keep those races pure and simple and untouched from evil. Got it. That sounds good. <laughs> sounds really good. Mine's like kind of feeling, feeling in comparison. Oh no, you're I just, fine. You're fine. Hey, hey, we're talking about different. No, no I, I, I was, I was winging it. Like if I didn't get an aberration, then I would have, I would have, uh, uh, I would have been hamstrung because uh, aberrations make for fun for fun villains. Oh yeah, absolutely. So other than the party themselves, what is the uh, the sin eaters flumped? Uh, what are the biggest obstacles in its path as far as endeavoring to uh, keep things simple and free of sin? I would imagine that because of the consumption of sun, it, uh, sin, it distorts the body. So I think there's a physical limitation. 
that um, they need to be moved, that they maybe have a corpulent body, even though they're supposed to be like psionically where poles have anti-gravity. I imagine it's a giant thing that is vulnerable. So he has a hard time moving from point A to point B. Thus, it hasn't already wiped whatever plane or country the players have encountered, um, but or maybe they've uh, you know encountered some of these emissaries. Um, but I'd say definitely physical movement is it's probably it's 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 weakness. Sure. Okay. All right. And uh, over to you, David. Uh, mm -hmm. How is your villain measuring degrees of success versus degrees of failure? Uh, degrees of success for its objective. I... Yes. Yeah. Well, its objective was, again, to accumulate wealth and power, but mm -hmm. it's also uh, taken on... Is there, on a... like, a limit to that? It's like, oh, once we get there, we're good. Or, no, I want to be the wealthiest person in this land. And, you know, where is success? Where is failure? Where does it stop, I guess, is the question. Well, one of the things that, that's happening is that it starts off as almost like an altruistic thing, you know, kind of Robin Hood-ish, you know, King of Thieves kind of thing. But it actually turns more, a little more sinister and all that. I mean, it's, you know, it, it almost comes down to almost something like the legend of sleepy hollow mixed with like a thieves guild or something yeah. like that because mm -hmm. basically what i had was the thieves they're a network of scarecrows oh that's cool they pose is... themselves in the fields and they spy and they steal and they and there there's one the raggedy man that's like the the king or whatever <laughs> among, among them so it's, he's also known as the king in tatters or something like that. Oh, no, I mean, if you had like crows as messengers, that would mm -hmm. be like apropos. That's really cool. I like it. It's great for October. Yeah, that's You're what I was thinking. You're bringing it, man. You're bringing it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so it would be yeah. something like that, you know. Okay. So. Yeah, no. So um, I was going to ask kind of motives. They kind of tie into your objectives a little bit. You know what motivates it uh, uh, in our blue book. We do have uh, uh, several options. You know, does your villain do it for the achievements, for glory, for affiliation? He just wants to have friends around him, and so it does evil acts because of that. He's aggressive. He just likes to beat the crap out of people or just fight things for any reason. Autonomy, wants freedom, exhibition, wants to be the center of attention, safety, they are afraid of something and so seek uh, uh, to make the world a safer place. Uh, are they uh, Kathy Bates? Are they nurturing? Are they just, no, they want to take care of you and they'll make sure they take care of you for the rest of your life. Uh, order, power, uh, secure, or understanding. Are they seeking knowledge? Uh, I feel like uh, we have a little mix of order and nurturing mm -hmm. uh, from the flump society. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, do you have anything you want to add on to that, Ian, or is pretty much... You know, thing? sometimes one of the most frightening things in the world mm -hmm. is someone that is um, has good intentions but has horrible outcomes. So they sure. believe themselves that they're doing something that is good and right, but it has horrible, horrible implications. So... You can't argue with someone that thinks they're doing something in the name of justice and goodness. Um, it, 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 sometimes that itself is more frightening than someone that's just purely evil or selfish because you understand that. But when someone's doing something horrible and saying, no, this is good, this needs to be happening, it really puts a, an interesting spin on morality. Um, would the multiverse be better if all preachers were... Um, had their evil inhibitions somehow forcefully ejected from their psyche, from their uh, meat computer in their skull? Um, like, what is the role of individuality and what does it mean to be human? Like, those are some frightening things when you really look at that as existential dread, especially framed in the context. This is a lawful, lawful good creature, but definitely all of the flumps as a whole, are traditionally lawful good through all of DD canon. What if you have one that has ultimately good outcomes it wants to make, but through 
horrible, horrible, horrible means. Well spoken. Damn you, Ian, and your wonderful creativeness. Why do we have him on the show? No. <laughs> <laughs> so the one time that like my ADD is, is useful so don't you deprive it me of it <laughs> all right, like the all one right. thing I can go that's you that's useful <laughs> I, I will take a second though to plug if you've never looked up the music group Loot the Body as in L-O-O-T the body on YouTube or Bandcamp they do have a song that is uh, I Am the Flumph in a traditional 60s psychedelic rock song. Nice. Fantastic. So uh, you owe yourself, if you're not familiar with Flumps or you love Flumps. I'm going to uh, have to check song. that out. <laughs> oh, it is fantastic. Uh, very much channeling the Beatles whimsy of Yellow Submarine album. But uh, music video too, if you look on on YouTube, but I am a Flump. And you won't get out of your head after you've seen it once. Nice. But, uh, nice. I'm afraid I'm still stuck on Diggy Diggy Hole, to be fair. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, David, uh, uh, kind of got a general idea on yours. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, maybe a little bit of autonomy, but maybe affiliation as well. Just trying to rise the ranks and just be surrounded by something. But uh, what do you say really motivates your specific villain? Uh revenge because one of the things that i just thought of uh yeah he couldn't uh the leader the raggedy man or the king in tatters uh was actually thought to be dead because the lord that exacted his taxes that he couldn't pay and all that burned him alive and almost his effigy or something like that so so you know (laughs) <laughs> these messages that come in from our producers sometimes oh my god but uh with you know uh so he kind of has revenge bur- burned in the the back of his mind i didn't say burned i'm not like you know uh, i know that's like he's referencing kind of- whatever <laughs> you know literally happened to them but that's why he's you know covered in burlap and tattered clothes and things like that is to hide the burns and things like so i'm sorry now i'm just imagining your villain <laughs> says puns all the time to his backstory yeah but doesn't realize it you well, won't really the, spy the writer Burrow does game. that <laughs> yeah the, <laughs> exactly so uh, uh would you say in his uh uh way to achieve revenge uh is he looking to uh uh yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. You said the king set him on fire, or uh, the Lord? noble, the noble, the noble, the Lord. Yeah. Is he looking to exact uh, a physical revenge, or is he more going for a metaphorical or something like that? Well, his his psyche keeps getting twisted, so mm-hmm. he's uh, you know, uh, eventually revenge is going to overtake him, and he's going to he's going to make the the Lord pay as well as the other Lord. Uh, noble lords and stuff like that because none of them said anything about this atrocity that this lord uh had done you know well that's interesting okay Mm -hmm. Uh, let's move on to some personality traits for your villains um a personality that others would say your villain has and a personality trait that your villain would say they have and then a trait that completely contradicts the villain in some way or fashion. You know, yeah, well, he's lawful, he's good, but he likes to just kick puppies. Whenever he sees a puppy, he just kicks it. <laughs> no one knows God. why yet, just, but that's yeah. what he does for some reason. You're gonna kick um, a puppy. Uh, so uh, let's go with David. What is someone else describing your villain uh what is one of the personality traits someone would give your villain um mm. insane insane just Mm -hmm. utterly uh not there or we talk insane in the moral sense of you're insane in the moral sense you're insane uh yeah and it kind of leaks out you know he gives this appearance as somebody doing you know 
you know, trying to rally followers to his cause, you mm-hmm. know, to help him. But he, the, the, what he ultimately has planned for revenge, it just gets more sinister. So okay. that kind of changes his alignment. So, you know, but yeah, it's kind of crazy. Every once in a while, the crazy slips out is basically what's happening. Sure. All right. Uh, Ian, a uh, personality trait that someone would associate with your flump. Uh, I would imagine that the rest of the flumps see this uh, sin eater as orderly and lawful and inherently, of course, good. And is and, and that is uh, anything that's that's fulfilling that function in their society would be seen that way. Uh, as far as people who are non within that uh, society, uh, their opinion would probably be very skewed because if you'd encountered this uh, directly, chances are it would detect your uh, evils, your impulses, your vices, and it would forcibly mind wipe you. So uh, you would probably have people that would just be drooling and think that this is the epitome of law and justice. Mm-hmm. Um, its contradictory trait would be empathy. It sees itself as being empathetic because it reads minds, as all flunks do. Um, but it's uh, it has it sees your vices, your your cravenness, your lusts, your whatever as a burden to you, and so it mercifully takes it from you uh, as a burden unto itself. So it thinks it's being empathetic when it's just robbing you of your individuality and what makes you your own sentient race. Sure. Okay. Uh, uh, going back over to David, contradictory trait, uh, and maybe how your villain views himself. Uh, contradictory trait. Uh, the villain views himself as noble and altruistic when that's really not what he is. You know, it's that's that's a facade for the mm-hmm. the poisoning of his soul. I guess. Sure. It is. Yeah. So. So I think I think that would kind of be the air or the personality trait that he would give off. So ultimately what I'm thinking is like kind of We're getting into the hard questions here, guys. Yeah. Yeah. It, it it's hard. It's hard because I'm thinking this off the top of my head, basically what I'm seeing is kind of, you know, almost like uh a wicker man kind of story, uh, uh, you know, mixed with like Legend of Sleepy Hollow mm. and uh, perhaps Children of the Corn kind of thing. So, you know, sure. so like uh, Children of the Corn, you had the charismatic leader Malachi or something mm. like that. So think, think of more along the lines of, you know, malachi i guess or something like that before he turned you know just completely well he was always completely bonkers but right you know eventually that's what he's gonna turn into or something like that so okay uh i think this is going to be a really quick one uh attitude Mm -hmm. how does your villain treat others and let's say your enemies or your friends or something like that, uh, fellow flumps as opposed to sinful. I mean, are they just immediately locked away? And then when their time comes to have their sin eaten, turned to mindless mush, then they get uh, 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 released? Or or do, do the villains approach uh, 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 these people who are there trying to save? Uh, uh, with that empathy uh, uh, until it's far too late and the other person doesn't know what's going on, uh, uh, does the um, does the thief, the ragged man, does he treat everyone with civility until maybe he encounters a noble's insignia before he bursts into insanity because anything involving with the Lord is something like that. Uh, Exactly what are you that. guys exactly that dang it i'm sorry David. no no you're helping me sort this out i'm just like 
yeah, that's it. <laughs> so now is this, how does he treat the scarecrows? Let's ask that. Are they? Uh, the scarecrows, uh, he, he treats well mm-hmm. and all that. But as the, the insanity progresses and all that, he starts, you know, at first it starts out, we're all equals among men and stuff like that. Well, you know, after a while, after a while, after a you while know, some of us are more equal than others. Exactly. So, or just, you know, uh, you can start to see it's becoming less of you're my servant, you know, you know, do what I say, you know, because I said so kind of thing or whatever. And the insanity is just leaching out. You know, they had a cause, but the insanity is kind of skewing it and is going to more revenge to where yeah. more horrible things are starting to happen. Like he's actually exacting physical revenge upon these nobles. Sure. And so then is he treating these scarecrows with that maybe that similar um, respect or that similar tolerance where? Yeah, they can go out of hand a little bit, but we're still going to treat them well. We're still going to give them their fair share. And so then cause the scarecrows to kind of follow him mm. willingly into that insanity. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. They start okay. to see him as a cult leader almost towards the end. So, oh, that gets creepy after a while. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. Ian, uh, your flump, how is he treating uh, those he is saving? What's the attitude that he has? Uh, towards him towards them i imagine it as very motherly like a very much a tired and worn out mother but still wants to carry the burdens of its children uh like a you know don't worry yourself like i'll take this from you kind of that self martyry feeling um mm-hmm. but that the entity itself wouldn't be that dangerous from a, a remote proximity so that people that would encounter this would probably do it through envoys of flumps themselves, channeling uh, the sin eater psionically from a distance. And as much as people who may be familiar with Planescape, with that many as one, uh, being a Karenian rat collective, that mm-hmm. uh, you encounter some rats that if in sufficient quantities can be a uh, speak on behalf of the hive mind, but you're not getting the full danger of being in its presence. So I imagine like, you may have a couple of curious flumps interact with the party that depending how many there are channels so much aspect of the sin eater. Uh, so you may not raise any suspicion at first and some grognards may be familiar with the flump from the old days. Um, but then more and more flumps speak of like, you know, in this weird tense as it's coming actually from the sin eater. So I think it just depends on how many flumps and their proximity to the main sin eater is what degree of interaction you get. Mm-hmm. But seeing this creature in its raw form up close and personal, it's going to be a very bad encounter. Probably something that I guess like, you know, maybe either like the compulsion effect that it has would be equi- akin to like a geese, if not a wish as far as permanent effect on players. Uh, so undoing that damage would be equal to be undoing that spell level effect. Okay. The aberration, I think, is going to be difficult and maybe a little bit short for this next question. Uh, Give it to me. Tastes and preferences. And so... Uh, I don't know why you do want to lick it, but I mean, I'm not judging you, Kyle. <laughs> Have you ever licked a flump? I mean, yes. I mean, oh. college was weird, okay, man? Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't so long ago, ago. Uh, you know, as far <laughs> I never as thought it'd come flump, back to haunt me. They're a regular flump. One of their defensive mechanisms, because they're very non-lethal, is to spray a noxious fluid. Um, I would imagine um, that the flump would probably comfort itself with either harvesting good memories once in a while, or okay. using a psionic ability to remember things that are good and virtuous that it samples is like a rare delicacy. Like, um, I don't know if they would use it against a sentient creature, like sampling their good memories, because that would be kind of an evil act. That would uh, maybe it would permit that, but um, yeah, just maybe stealing one or two good memories on the side. That can't be too bad, right? In the, in the face of the greater good that it's making. 
I mean, actually, that makes it way worse. Um, Gosh, yeah, that, that I think that personality trait, that contradictory one there, uh, yeah, that's kind of gets you there. Just Ugh, like, yeah, but you know, every once worse. in a while, I got to take a good memory because this is hard work, and I just need yeah, I, I I owe it to myself. I mean, who else is going to do this hard work if I don't take care of myself? Treat yourself, Queen. Okay, uh, uh, if you want more time to think about this, uh, I'll go over to David for a couple questions here. Okay, what? Uh, and this is for Ian. What specific type of memory, like does he like walk on the beaches or uh, something like that? Golden, does your is just irresistible to your golden friend. Elysian fields. I imagine that a lot of flumps are encountered in subterranean and in dungeon esque environments, and being uh, its body distorted and corpulent from absorbing so many psionic bad thoughts and evil impulses, but it doesn't get out to the surface or maybe it has never because maybe it's landlocked by its mass. Mm -hmm. uh, so just like that sound of music, like those out, you know, those alpine uh, golden fields and frolicking that that might be its other motivations. It wants to uh, tickle its tendrils against shafts of gentle wheat, you know, spring wheat or uh, to feel the kiss of like early spring rains. And that's, it's like, humanity uh that it, it, it desperately wants but it knows it can't ever because it has to do this moral imperative of consuming sin and being locked away from uh other people yeah so what i'm hearing is if you live in an out town in germany and you encounter a flump run away because you're going to lose the bad and the good oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, god question is you know can your flump control himself in a situation like that if he encounters a town where everyone has memories of flocking through fields and enjoying that could he stop so. himself from taking no. each and every one of those yeah when you've had that much corruption how much will you have in the face of temptation i mean that's the other side it's like the harder you diet um it's harder, it's you, you get that buildup of resistance to like temptation. But once you hit that critical threshold, you just binge. Like you just binge and binge hard. Like you just suck all the minds as hard as you can. Wow. <laughs> I mean, we've all got, we've all tried to diet, right? And like, well, oh, you, yeah. You mess, oh, up, yeah. mess up hard. You don't like, oh, I ate one too many people. It's not, I just no, I bought no, seven you. cakes. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> I just happened to eat like all this orphanage. Like, you know, it happens. It happens. <laughs> Piled, I will destroy you. Like, it happens. Okay. All right. Over to you, David. Taste preferences. Um, your villain has uh, uh, at least an idea, porn. a thought. Porn? porn? What? Porn. Oh, corn. The corn. Crow. I was just. <laughs> Yeah, it's like corn. Sorry, that's like it's just like corn. corn. <laughs> I'll rebuke re myself. He is a vicious. <laughs> okay. Wine, wine, he a corn. He likes corn. I'll, I'll no. <laughs> Your raggedy man has a uh, a sense of nobility, and so I imagine that that comes with he doesn't spend all his time for revenge. He does have mm -hmm. to pretend to be pretend to have leisurely activities right so what does he do in his leisure time in his off time in his uh, off time yeah when he's uh, like you know what i have been obsessing over killing the son of a bitch lord i need time for myself where am i going well you know one of the barns that they set up is their high place is actually a day spa you know oh, yeah. <laughs> uh no, we'll give you him some a corn kind of bed massage chair. Exactly. <laughs> it's like um unlimited popcorn. No, uh let sculpture, wooden sculptures. That's oh, okay. That focus, you know how Da Vinci took a you know a stone and would just, you know, and Michelangelo with the sculptors and stuff like that, they would just project into the stone and then they say the work was there i just let it out or whatever so i mean he kind of thinks that or something like that so you know 
I mean, <laughs> okay, it's a yeah. release. It, he's got to do something because, I mean, it, it's just revenge 24-7 otherwise sure, with this sure. guy. I like the dichotomy here where we have this impending doom that just simply cannot be stopped with the flump. Mm-hmm. And then we have the mad thief where he's got the crazy scarecrows just watching you all the time. Mm-hmm. And then every once in a while, the party encounters a wood statue, a sculpture, uh, wood. And it's just like, what the hell? <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know. I just came up with something crazy. So no, you know, no, we said I, downtime. And it's just like, okay, he will. That's an odd thing to think <laughs> about for villains. But I mean, no, I, I went surely big. always be doing that. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, for pets i was going to ask something similar to that but i feel like uh, with the scarecrow you might have a crow theme for pets yeah or you know the person discovered magic or something like that that could be corrupting them so they learned how to cast find familiar or flock of familiars and things like that or you know that could be something he bestows upon the scarecrows is that they're able to do this and they have their network that what they do is they spy on the king's road and that's how they just monitor all the nobilities you know their traffic and stuff like that around so okay uh we're getting close to the end here i think it might be time to ask a little bit of history kind of get a better sense of your villains here so let's get names going on here uh what is the name of your flump ian Ah, shit. You, shoot. Uh, you got me there. I got him! I finally got him! <laughs> I didn't think about name. I just thought of it like capacity. Uh, oof. That's, that's good. Um, I think that it might have had a... Actually, I have no idea if flumps themselves have individual names. Like, as far as the ecology, I don't know. I imagine that if it had one, it was superseded by its title as that is something that you wouldn't want to have someone be individualized being a sin eater because that recognizes their humanity and your connection with them because being a sin eater is always otherness. Uh, and that could be a central point of spite is that no one knows its name um, or and perhaps it's a danger at losing its own name, which is the most frightening thing. And it's the one thing they can't control is if they forget that, um, then they've fundamentally lost control uh, so, I, I mean, that could be a tertiary motivation of something is to find something that, you know, the wizard that spawned it or the, you know, some archival thing, but, um, that, that could be, it's one grid of sand stuck in its eye. Sure. Let's keep going with that grid of sand. Uh, one last personal question for it. What is the greatest disappointment? That it hasn't already accomplished its goal. That it's taken so long? Uh, Yeah. I mean, and all the time that it takes to do its ultimate goal, there's more sin happening, more murder, more crime, everything. And that's all its fault and all its responsibility. So it feels tremendous guilt of all the sin that has happened because it has not been efficacious enough or it's landlocked or it hasn't done its job. It's its fault. It's constantly haunted by it. Okay. Oof. Yeah, no. Uh, overwhelming, impeding doom coming from Ian. Uh, let's go with a little bit more manageable. David. Yeah. <laughs> what is your villain's name? I thought about that right now. I mean, as I mean, far we as we called him the Raggedy Man or the King in Tatters. Uh, but. He actually has a it's name. Sexual that he, name, yeah. He can't remember anymore. The name, last name Cole, stands out. C O L E, not C O A L. Part no. of the fire, <laughs> yeah. Pun that keeps coming up. C O L E. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and one of his idioms is that, or eccentricities, is he's like. Uh, one of the things that he would do is recite the the rhyme about old King Cole was a merry old soul, you know, but it takes on a deeper meaning to him and all that. So, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. 
how did he learn to organize the scarecrows into what the party sees them as now? You know, um, oh, I don't want to give you stuff here. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> no, give it to me. Give it to me. So, no. Yeah. How yeah, does yeah. he learn to fight with these guerrilla tactics? Um, how did that develop? Is it something from a younger age? from this past life maybe he doesn't remember how but right. maybe he used to do that or was it all trial and error since the day he started recovering i think it would it would be more trial and error because i mean i, I mean i've read some history about uh tactics and how units and all that have developed and some of them developed from no organization whatsoever, no rhyme or reason, just things just kind of clicked. And then, you know, that's how they get their, their, um, they develop their, their squad tactics and stuff like that. It's just like, it was trial and error. They discovered what worked, what didn't, you know, the whole network of the scarecrows and stuff like that, that just evolved just, you know, I mean, he, he just clothed himself with what he could find in, in the field that he was burned in. And then, you know, I mean, and it just kind of just all evolved from there. So like uh, he started to find other, other farmers or whatever who had lost things. So they just started, I don't know. It, it, some organizations just start, start out of chaos, you know, like criminal organizations you know and eventually an ir uh hierarchy emerges or something like that sure so what you're saying is this organization rose from the ashes pretty much <laughs> there we okay. go mm -hmm. all right uh unfortunately that is all our time tonight uh believe me there were a lot more questions to ask you but honestly uh listening to your answers were absolutely delightful <clears throat> once again we have ian's nameless Lump. flump <laughs> of such grotesque magnitude that it cannot move but it searches it tries and it hates itself for not being able to rid you of all your sin as well as you know trying to keep it going forward with its delicious appetite of uh, uh, Julia Roberts, not Julia Roberts, Julie Andrews. There we go. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, we have David, uh, uh, the raggedy man, the thief, coal burned by the lords in his land, seeking revenge, creating an organization, gathering them about the scarecrows, uh, a noble person, just a mask, just like that scarecrow's mask mm -hmm. that hides a uh, a morally uh, insane person behind it. Uh, right. Oh, and oh, yeah. he likes to leave his artwork everywhere, and I'm sure it's also there. You go. Know. I was thinking uh, you could also flip the switch on that instead of uh, the noble who burned a poor farmer. It could have been the farmers that burned a noble that overtaxed them, and this is him coming to exact revenge on the village or town. Kind of yes. like a burned man from Fallout New Vegas. Maybe. <laughs> so. See, it makes me think you say that, and it's just like, oh, does he then gather the farmers to be scarecrows, and he just leads them on these raids Ooh, with intentions of getting them killed? Could be. I don't know. Like I said, I, I mean, that's one guys, thing I guys, love about these. Here. I love these sessions because, man, you, we just <laughs> we just go. <laughs> So guys, uh, hop on Twitter, uh, hit us up at mhobo Inc. on Twitter there, or hit us up over on Discord. Talk about Ian, talk about David's uh, 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 villain ideas, how you would change them, how you would make them better. Uh, who is the winner of the Iron DM? But let's be fair, I'm the winner because I wrote all down their ideas. And he did, and he's going to use Thursday, them too. <laughs> I'm going to use them against my players. Oh, so delightfully. <laughs> Let us know if you use them in your own groups or anything else. Yeah, yeah. Let us yeah. know how you adapt it. Mm -hmm. Or if you have great topics you want to see on the show. Yeah, great questions up. submitted by our loyal viewers. Like, yes. subscribe. 
We've Please. got someone who needs to write the new script here, and uh, hopefully I can talk <laughs> to it. Guys, I am Kyle. We have David. We have Ian. Instead of the spiel, we're just going to wave goodnight. Go Enjoy check Christmas. out the Kickstarter over at How to RPG with Your Cat. 48 hours left. Give them all our love and support. Uh, other than that, good night. Good night, everybody. <laughs>